Hello future or current UTS Masters of Architecture students. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing 113613 elective. Basically meeting, I'm going to be giving my thoughts and feelings about it, and then I'll go through my final assessment too, and that yes, that means there are only two assignments in this elective. Straight off the bat, I'd like to say I initially did a review of this course, but I think I didn't do it justice. I also forgot to add the bit where I go through my work. I'll start off by saying first assignment I did, did terribly, needed a lot of work according to my teacher. I took the criticism, I applied it to my work, ended up with an HD for the final essay. So I'm very pleased with that and I'm just going to read that from beginning to end. Before I do that, I want you to know that the emphasis of assessment two was not prescribed on the content. I hope that makes sense, probably didn't. Uh, meaning you can write whatever you want, so long as it's based on the core text that we were given. And in this course, it might change next year, I don't know. We did Corel Tigers, oh, Corel Tigers, The Minimum Dwelling, which was written quite some time ago. Our teacher, Andrew Benjamin, wasn't really focused on what you're writing so long as it was teaching him something new and interesting, but it had to be based off that core text. Assessment two, we were given two tasks. We had to make a collage, which was based on the content of our essay. In my case, and I, I will go over it after I read it because I think it won't make much sense. And I don't expect most of this will make sense to people listening to this without reading Corel Tigas The Minimum Dwelling. Nevertheless, let's get into it. Let's have some fun. The functionalism of Corel Tiga and Walter Gropius differs as a function of their respective reading of the social content inherent within the architectural floor plan. As a result, Teague critiqued Bauhaus's architecture's tendency to arbitrarily feature superfluous space and ornamentation due to their reluctance to address dwelling for the proletariat and mimic luxurious classical styles. The same mode of thinking was expressed by Gropius in 1924, prior to Teague's 1932 minimum dwelling, in the scope of total architecture, 1955, reading, man is undoubtedly endowed with the capability of building his dwelling soundly and adequately, but innate inertia and sentimental attachment to tradition are obstructing his progress. While both say form follows function, Teague highlights the Bauhaus's use of non-functional space. A comparison between Teague and Gropius reveals that their architectural ethe share functional constructs, however, diverge between challenging or maintaining the dominant social hierarchies implicit within architecture. Both represent functionalist tectonics of modernism, but also reflect alternate interpretations of how architecture should be used in the broader social context. In examining Walter Gropius and Corel Teague's interpretation of how the minimum dwelling needs to function, the tension between thinking individually and thinking collectively emerges due to opposing socio-economic contexts. The minimum dwelling challenged CM's housing proposal, an extension of the Bauhaus movement which Gropius helped establish. As Teague sought to develop a set of standardized design responses to the living requirements of social groups within all communities rather than primarily focusing on the processes of building or parasitic land speculation, as he argued Siam's affiliates merely reduced the building size while enforcing existing social hierarchies. Gropius and Teague sought to resolve economic issues and labor shortages during a housing crisis, in which their response to dwelling had been shaped by ideological understandings of social function. Teague recommended the subsistence minimum, to reduce high-density population's waste per capita while providing an acceptable modern standard of living at the expense of private ownership and the nuclear family, also criticizing Gropius to have failed in capitalizing the high-rise hotel model due to an underutilization of space. These tensions are evident in the social function dictated in their architectural plans. Responding to Europe's disparity in housing equality, Teague inevitably had to question the dominant Western tropes of understanding architecture's function. The minimum dwelling is confronting to most Western audiences as it sets aside individual needs for the generalized proletarian abode, implemented preceding a breakdown of social hierarchy predicted in Marxist theory. Stemming from predicting the social ramifications is how the integration of women into production and public life should change the architectural plan, and how we dwell in an apartment as a collective body of self-sustaining communities. For this reason, 
Functionalism and utilitarianism are often cited by Teague to prove socializing the capitalist hotel model is an optimally productive use of space due to the real estate principle that low houses result in higher rent, thereby making the high-rise minimum dwelling reduce asset value while affording a good standard of living. An obvious result is that small apartments cannot adequately provide all the functions formerly satisfied by a large patrician bourgeois apartment. It consistently abolishes the nuclear family. All family-based configurations of the private space are perceived as a redundant bourgeois practice, therefore making interaction external to the cell. The minimum dwelling is a subsistence minimum of necessity where the sleeping room is a moment of absolute privacy, and public engagement takes place outside of this room in universal spaces, comparable to monastic living cells. Through this logic, a population's waste and carbon footprint is reduced per capita to an absolute minimum in opposition to urban sprawl's dependence on private car ownership, which Teague believes impedes city productivity and accessibility and should prioritize social distance before spatial proximity. Teague anticipated early theories of identity politics as standardized living cells are equal yet unforgivingly unaccepting of individual requirements and expression. This decolonization of architectural function against social norms brings the implicit value judgment of how Teague believed the norm must function. The minimum dwelling, written before the advent of queer theory, can be perceived as inherently heteronormative as the needs of the majority outweigh the needs of the minorities. Gropius and Teague both express the view that ornamentation, a symbolically feminine symbol, is no longer necessary in architecture as the building's functionality derives from beauty itself. This is concurrent with a series of logical contradictions emerging from Teague's utopian amalgamation of functionalist poeticism to find a new architectural style that benefits the social context of the minimum dwelling. Individual rooms can be larger and perform greater function. However, this would negate equality and public productivity ambitions, for which reason only uncommon circumstance permitted minimum dwellings to increase in size based on self-described arbitrary rationalizations. Teague envisaged the individual dwelling as a functional space, designed on the model of a sleeping compartment of a railroad car or the cabin of a cruise ship, to be strictly standardized elements with which will be mass-produced according to biologically and anthropologically established norms. This radical social hypothesis reflects the theoretical, rather than practical, nature of his minimum dwelling, as scientific functionalists constantly use terms borrowed from scientific man management, but their use of these terms remains somewhat vague in the 1920s and 1930s, because these methods were not yet applied in practice. During Teague's admonition of CM, the Zlin phenomenon had shown merit behind large entities taking responsibility for the housing of entire groups of people with one exception to how Teague envisaged public housing. It was funded by a private company and assumed the traditional family home for family living. Teague did not comment on this successful capitalist housing in Czechoslovakia, as he deemed this as enforcing white-collar family living without offering social housing under Marxist interpretation. Zlin's factory production of workers' housing is symptomatic of a hyper-productive capitalist industry boosting quality of life the corporate means which in turn ignored the concept of the minimum dwelling in favor of Americanized capitalist town planning. To Teague, capitalism appeared as a force that had alienated art from its natural function by pushing it along a course of autonomous development and separating it from the everyday concerns and interests of the great mass of people, promoting him to create a design resurgence equivalent to that of Gothic architecture. Ironically, the Soviets turned to revivalist Gothic architecture and pseudo-functionalist boxes during Stalin's regime, which Teague did not live long enough to experience, which arguably replicated Gropius's prefabrication method for efficient labor, but lacked aesthetic quality and subsistence minimum. Like Teague, Walter Gropius attempted to resolve housing costs by reducing and simplifying labor requirements. Gropius was primarily driven by the process and economics of building, whereas Teague focused on the hypothetical social implications within the building. Therefore, their goals could be collaboratively achieved under the circumstance of building experimentally, as both actively pushed for a practice that realizes the best functional social implications. 
The obvious trait is Gropius designed for the nuclear family or bachelor apartment. The only novel characteristic which shaped a new architectural vernacular was determining design based on the economics of construction. As Gropius believed, the more we organize physical labor, the more the human spirit will be emancipated. A link is formed with Heidegger's building dwelling thinking as Gropius dictates the plan based on economic construction methods in order to purportedly halve construction costs and, el and eliminate the requirement of architectural services as a symptom of a well-articulated module. There is no central view of the Bauhaus, but for that there are a number of entrances which emphasize the building's various functions. The word Bauhaus means to build or building a home or dwelling place. Reducing the size of superfluous rooms in favor of increasing living comforts without oppressing legitimate individual requirements or adhering to contemporary fashions is emphasized by Gropius, maintaining individuality as he referred to denying this as short-sighted and unwise. As Teague and Gropius are functionalists, the mantra, form follows function, applies to both. First espoused by Lewis Sullivan, became the guiding principle as the Bauhaus sought a closer partnership with industry to exploit the potential of mass production. This added to the machine aesthetic that is today associated with the international style, which connotated upper-class dwelling that T hoped to overcome, similarly opposed by Joseph Gokar, who objected to calling construction in Zlin architecture, which could be extended to Teague and Gropius's work. It was rather, he remarked, the assembly line production of projects. This ought to have appealed to Teague who repeatedly urged architects to apply new methods of standardization, typification, and scientific management to create the new architecture. Gropius differs in floor plan, as his architecture functions to provide every family with the basis for a healthy life, suggesting the scale of such dwellings change depending on access to capital, while the quality must comply with modern standards, which Teague argued could not be guaranteed under a capitalist system. Gropius's Bauhaus movement would have assisted Teague in finding the solution to the minimum dwelling, open threshold challenge in mass manufacturing. Except the functional condition, whether floor to ceiling or long horizontal expression, which the minimum dwelling could not achieve without changing its utilitarian fixtures that would result in a larger floor plan. Gropius emphasized the construction process of industrial prefabrication to reduce building waste and improve the economy of building, which would presumably have a trickle-down effect onto the consumer. While Teague eventually proved correct in asserting this theory would not sustain, the formation of Bauhaus replaced craft with industrial production, realized alongside an avowed communist associate, Hans Meyer, who was exiled from Germany to Russia due to political concerns, which nevertheless formed to reduce the enormous waste of materials, time and labor, of hand-built buildings. This focus may have been motivated by his context of inflation following World War II with labor shortages, which had to account for Germany's social conditions of a surplus of vacant housing compared to Czechoslovakia's pre-World War II. The collective theory was that materials made possible by new technology should be used in the, in the design and creation of both art and utilitarian objects, which, in turn, would attune to larger architectural designs. The Bauhaus buildings, designed by Gropius, were themselves concrete examples of the emerging Bauhaus aesthetic. They consisted of a complex of structures organized asymmetrically in pinwheel fashion with unornamented exteriors and flat roofs. Glass curtain walls revealed the structural framework of reinforced concrete and brick box-like structures, with spare interiors populated with tubular metal furniture reduced to structural necessity products exhibiting undecorated geometric form and sans serif uncapitalized typography. To Teague, the Bauhaus model is an example of flaunting redundant space rather than utilitarian practicality. However, the goal of producing a building with minimal labor and material efforts is identical in intent, a merit of which Teague noted. The merit of Gropius' high-rise houses is that they are conceived as straightforward row houses, which, when compared to Le Corbusier's arabesques, or the standard American high-rise tower, allows all apartments uniform access to sunlight. Gropius uses the steel frame as the basic structural system for his gallery-type high-rise redesigns. Each dwelling unit consists of separate rooms for an adult male and female. These are intended not as bedrooms, but as a universal space, designed to serve all private dwelling functions, sleeping, rest, storage of clothes, reading, study, intimate life, etc. 
On the topic of gender equality's incorporation into the modern plan, the varying philosophies of education and approaches practiced by the diverse faculty of the Bauhaus contributed to the complex pedagogical goals of Gropius' school. The curriculum was instituted by a number of artist teachers who did not necessarily agree with one another or with Gropius. However, female contributors of the Bauhaus were not given credit, which should be unsurprising given Teague's perspective on Western sexism at the time. As Bauhaus perpetuated the traditional family home in their context, it would be expected to resemble a patriarchy in practice. However, Gropius' school employed influential women and symbolized an emerging new woman in Germany. As far as Teague is concerned, all Western architects failed to deliver a socially equitable scheme due to their fallacy in, in replicating quasi-luxurious palaces that would become more unaffordable in an unsocialized environment, a byproduct of their privileged upbringing. Teague produced a maximalist socialist solution to Europe's post-World War I housing crisis. However, it has been disregarded and never realized in practice. The ability of both Gropius and Teague to apply their concepts can be narrowed down to the economic circumstances of capitalism and Marxist theory at the time of formulating the minimum dwelling. Teague's approach is yet to be granted in real application, which can be judged by the same standard as Gropius's built architecture. The question of functionalism working appropriately can therefore only be distinguished by the built against the hypothetical. Teague's minimum dwelling has never been tested, from which it can be surmised that individuals in a free market and even existing communist or socialist societies opt out of applying its prescriptions, as they universally prefer spacious functionalism instead of individual living styles, despite the associated social and environmental implications credits now that we've read it i think this will make a little bit more sense to everybody so here's Karel tiga staring down the uh swan collage of his own creation i did not put this one together so there's the uh feminism symbol on his forehead because he perceived himself as a feminist and here's kind of the honest intention it's it's actually you have socialism and communism or marxism at, at the end of the road and then down that road is actually capitalism running away everybody has their individual cars they have their uh individual apartments and it's all about floor plans and this eye of sauron this parasitic eye which i refer to in my essay is because that's exactly how Corral Tiga views capitalism. So to him, it's kind of they're staring at each other, but he's more focused on on ideas that are yet to really be able to be practiced. Um, but in his case, the ideas which he's discussing are, um, well, they are yet to work. Let's put it that way. Whew. Reading that took a lot more effort than I thought it would. Whoa. I believe the essay requirement was that we had a minimum word limit of 1,500 words, but then you could go hypothetically to 10,000 if you really wanted to. I think mine was about 3,000 words. I'd just like to finish off this content, which I just read over was my own. If my essay is going to scare you off, please don't let it because some people wrote in much plainer English and they still did very well for themselves. So this is just how I like to express myself in essay format. Thank you so much for watching. Please let me know if this video was of any use to you. Please ask any questions about the course in the comment section. I'd greatly appreciate that. And I'll hopefully be able to help you make a decision if this is the course for you. And thank you for making it this far in the video. It's been a big one. Great. See you next time. Oh, and happy 2022. Yeah.